You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this Indo-Pacific uh, Foreign Policy and Defense Seminar today uh, with our guests and colleagues at the General Accounting Office on the topic of assessing the benefits and costs of US military presence in Japan and South Korea. It's noon here on the East Coast of the United States in the Washington DC area. And we're delighted uh, that the GAO high powered team uh, who have authored this report are with us. And I wanna welcome all of our participants. I know you're joining us from the region, uh, from some, in some cases, Europe, West Coast of the United States, et cetera. So, Welcome to you all and as well, welcome to those who are joining us uh, on the live stream YouTube channel uh, to engage in this program. Now, I can't think of a topic that has occasioned more um, discussion in terms of our alliance relationships and the costs and benefits of our alliances. Uh, you all know that this was a major issue in the 2016 campaign, remained a major issue over the last four years in terms of discussions at the policy level and continue to animate discussions leading up to and through the 2020 elections. But it's not just an election issue. It's a fundamental assessment of what are the costs and benefits of US alliances. In this case, looking at two uh, uh, alliance relationships, the longstanding ones with Japan and the Republic of Korea. And um, the issues are complex. Um, they're numerical, but they're also qualitative. And one of the great things that our good friends at GAO do is do serious, analytical, empirical, nonpartisan work, which they will describe to you overall. But I'm glad to engage them. This is the uh, uh, next in a series of work we've, uh, seminars we've done with them on their findings. And that has covered everything from technology acquisition by China to our relations with the freely associated states or the compact uh, relationships. Uh, to this one on alliances. I'm also happy to report and note that this, um, this report, though obviously done overall in English, has summaries both in Korean and Japanese languages uh, on the website. And the links to the full report, as well as these summaries, will be available to you in the chat session. Now, um, I want to go straight away to uh, our, our, our GAO colleagues to brief. Um, but I want to um, note uh, their biographies and how uh, extensive uh, their work and experience in these studies has been. But if I were to do that, I would take 20, 30 minutes to go through their bios. I'm not going to do that. I, I urge you to refer to the work they've done and the, um, and the expertise they bring to these, uh, to these uh, analyses. So with that, let me turn immediately to the director of the Defense Capabilities and Management Team at the General Government Accountability Office, uh, Ms. Uh, Diana Maurer, and uh, delighted to welcome you and your team. Uh, Diana, over to you. Great, thank you so much, and, and many thanks to the East-West Center. It's, it's a real honor and a privilege to have, have the opportunity for the team to speak with everyone today about our recently published report. I also wanna welcome everyone who's, uh, who's watching today's presentation and uh, really let you know that we are open to questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So please take advantage uh, of the opportunity to ask us questions uh, about our work. Um, we, we really enjoy this chance to talk about uh, the important work that we've done here. Um, to give you some idea of the folks who are presenting today, you see the slide there. And one of the things that I think is particularly noteworthy about this work, which was looking at the costs and benefits of the US uh, military presence in Japan and South Korea, is that we pulled together a multidisciplinary team here at GAO. So the, the folks who will be talking to you today are from both our defense team, because we wanted to make sure we had that the knowledge and expertise about defense budget and defense spending and, and military posture in Asia, combined with our colleagues from the international affairs and trade team within GAO, because obviously the alliance structure and international and, and foreign relations are a key aspect to this as well. And by bringing together a 
people with that, that uh, common uh, body of expertise, the, the overall value of the work was, was only enhanced. So we'll have everyone briefly introduce themselves as they, uh, they start speaking in their part of the presentation. And as Satu mentioned, I am a director in the defense capabilities and management team at GAO. So uh, next slide. So here's a, just a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, because we have a, a number of folks from, from different countries, we're gonna spend a couple, just a couple of minutes on what the GAO is, you know, who we are from the, the Government Accountability Office, what role we play within the federal government here in the United States, why we did this work and who asked us to do the work, give a background on US military presence in Japan and South Korea, and then walk through our key findings sort of in, in three major buckets, the, the benefits of the US presence, the financial cost of the US presence, and then the amounts that um, Japan and South Korea have contributed in terms of financial support. And then we'll wrap up with some conversations about current ongoing GAO work that um, helps support congressional oversight of issues of interest um, to this part of the world. Next slide, please. But first, what is, what is GAO, right? So with the US Government Accountability Office, um, just listening to those words, it may not necessarily immediately give a sense of, of what we're about. Probably the most important word on that slide is the one independent. We are part of the federal government. We are a federal agency. We are part of the United States government. We are not part of the executive branch. Uh, we're part of the legislative branch, which means we're part of the Congress. And in that role, we are nonpartisan, which means the folks you'll be talking to today are not political appointees. We don't have an, an official party designation and we work to deliver fact-based unbiased analysis, right? We are, our responsibility is to get information that Congress asks us to look for, collect it, analyze it, and then report back to the Congress and, and the public as well. Um, the vast majority of our products are unclassified. We think that's vitally important, even when we're reporting on potentially sensitive topics around military issues or international issues. 98% um, of the time, we're able to issue something that's publicly available because that's, that's a cornerstone of our mission, informing the Congress as well as informing the public. Here within the US, obviously our, our, our primary um, recipients of the work of Congress, but it's also important for US taxpayers to understand what the federal government spends its money on. So within GAO, we're about 3000 people agency-wide and we cover all aspects of what the US government spends money to do. So obviously today we're focused on international and defense issues, but we report on tax policy and healthcare and, and labor policy and environmental regulations. And basically, if you can think of something the US federal government does, we are there to provide oversight and, and issue products to the Congress. One of the other thing that's important to understand about us is that since we are part of the Congress and since we are nonpartisan and independent, our leadership is not changed at all when there's a change in presidential administrations, right? So in, in the change from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, that affected no one here at GAO directly. We didn't get new people in senior positions. We didn't have people leave the agency. We were not involved in, in those presidential transitions at all in terms of changes in personnel or, or direction. Likewise, when there's a change in party leadership within the US Congress, that does not affect us. So for in instance, uh, recently here in the US, the, the Senate flipped from uh, the Republicans who were in the majority are now in the minority and, and vice versa for the Democrats that had no impact on GAO directly. Uh, we are all civil servants and we're committed to providing independent nonpartisan work. And that's what this report that we're gonna talk about today is, is really fundamentally about. You know, we inform debate about policy issues, but most importantly, we don't take positions directly on those policy issues. 
So for those of you who've seen our report, you know, and we'll talk about this in a minute, it reports how much has been spent, the reports and what we've heard from other experts about the benefits. GAO does not have a position on alliances. We don't have a position on how much the US should be paying, how much the South Korean government should be paying, how much the Japanese government should be uh, paying. We are pro reporting information, providing the analysis to inform debate around those important policy topics. So with that, I will uh, pause and hand it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Jason Baer, on onto, onto the next slide. Great, thanks so much, Diana. Uh... And, and let me just take a second and, and thank the East West Center again. It's, it's a, a great pleasure and honor to be back uh, doing another event with you all. And I think one of the thing that, things that, that uh, we really appreciate about coming back is, is the wonderful events that you all put on, uh, you know, the great audience participation, you know, very, very timely topics. And so we're glad that we can and support you all as you try to, you know, raise the level of discourse and understanding around a whole variety of issues. And um, we kind of playing on, on the setup that Diana already laid out for you, we do work for Congress and fundamentally that means that uh, they might pass uh, a mandate, uh, something in law that would require us to do a particular study or a chairman or a ranking member of a committee might choose to send a letter requesting us to do work. This particular work uh, we're doing from the FY 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. And you've already heard a little about, you know, the study, and for those of you who've read the report, you see a lot of information on what the benefits are uh, to the United States uh, national security specifically, as well as detailing the costs uh, on the U.S. part, as well as the burden sharing uh, on our partners part. You know, what are they contributing? What does that look like? Things like that. And this really is um, kind of a great example of how Congress can use uh, the information that, that we can provide. I think uh, what we've been able to produce over the last year is probably the most detailed assessment of uh, what, is the, what is the real cost um, from 2016 to 2019 uh, for both the U.S. And, and our partners here. And so what you're going to hear uh, over the time that we have to discuss the report is really a lot of that detail. Um, but I think that detail does roll up to some higher level questions. As Diana mentioned, you know, we don't take positions on who should pay how much or, or whether the benefits are worth the costs and those kinds of questions. And, and really what Congress was after here in this situation was real unbiased, strong information um, that was well supported about what are the benefits and the costs. Because the reality is they're inundated in, with information from people on all sides of these debates. And so they, they knew they needed uh, somebody that they could go to who could get the information and give them uh, the real ground truth. And so that's what uh, hopefully we've been able to achieve with this report. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Jody Sandell, um, to give a little bit of background to make sure we're all starting from the same place. Jody, on to you. Thanks, Jason. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, you can switch to the next slide. So um, the US has a long history of engagement with both Japan and South Korea, both militarily, economically, diplomatically, culturally. Um, in terms of our military presence, we've had some sort of military presence in both countries since the end of World War II. In Japan, we currently have about 55,000 military personnel and about the same number of military um, DOD civilians and uh, military dependents. Um, Japan is home to the United States only forward deployed carrier group in Yakuska. We have an F-35 unit located in Iwakuni but the majority of our United States military presence is located in Okinawa, which is a small Southern Island prefecture. It has about 1% of the Japanese landmass, but more than 50% of the US military personnel. Generally speaking, the Japanese public is supportive of the US military presence in the country, but it's in Okinawa where that support is a bit more contentious. So to try to alleviate some of the concerns on that island, um, the Japanese and the U.S. governments have come to several agreements, first in 1995 and then again in 20, 2006 and 2012, um, to realign and relocate some of the forces there. So some of the forces within Okinawa are realigning up north to the newly being built Futenma replacement facility. It's in a less congested area of the island. And then about 9,000 forces will be leaving the island of Okinawa entirely, going instead to Guam, Hawaii, the continental United States and Australia. Now, uh, those efforts in Okinawa have been a bit delayed, but the US and the Japanese governments remain committed to them. And in part that was demonstrated during last week's visit to Japan by the secretaries of defense and state. 
In South Korea, we currently have about 28,500 military personnel. The largest uh, body of them is located at the Army Base Camp Humphreys. This is the United States' largest overseas military base. Like in Japan, in South Korea, there has been an effort to realign the forces within the country. Um, in 2002, the Land Partnership Plan was signed to realign some of the forces. And then in 2004, the Yongsan Relocation Plan was signed. This was an effort to relocate forces from the Seoul metropolitan area down to Camp Humphreys, which is about 40 miles south of um, Seoul. Now, those efforts in South Korea are largely complete, although um, DOD expects some realignments to continue beyond the year 2022. As we're thinking about the US military presence in Japan and South Korea, and as we go through the findings of the report, I think the important thing for you all to remember is that Japan and South Korea are important to the United States military posture and they're very important to our alliances. And Jonathan will get into that next. Okay, great. Thank you, Jody. You can move on to the next slide. So I will be discussing our first finding on the benefits of the US military presence in Japan and South Korea. And so as, as you can see in this graphic on the slide, we identified six main benefits and we found that there was broad agreement among US officials and non-governmental experts that we interviewed about these benefits. But before I briefly discuss each benefit, I do wanna say a couple of quick things about our methodology. Uh, the first is that these benefits don't reflect GAO's independent assessment of what those benefits are, so much as they represent the key themes that we identified through our analysis of strategy documents and relevant expert studies. Um, additionally, these benefits were widely cited in our interviews with officials and experts. And I think the second thing I would note by way of methodology is that this list is not necessarily an, ex an exhaustive one of all possible benefits derived from our forward presence in Japan and South Korea. And we, we recognize also that many of these benefits overlap and indeed are mutually reinforcing. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about our methodology for this first finding following our presentation, but I'd also direct you to appendix one of our report for a more detailed discussion of our methodology. So with that said, um, I will move on to a brief discussion of each of these different benefits. The first is that the US military presence helps to maintain regional stability and security by providing, among other things, a credible deterrent to an increasingly assertive China, as well as a nuclear armed North Korea, for example. And many of the experts we spoke with identified this benefit category as the single most important benefit category, with all the other benefits helping to undergird or otherwise support regional stability and security. Um, but while they did know that this was the most important benefit category, I do want to also add um, that the way that these different benefits are displayed in this graphic, they're not meant to signify any kind of ranking in terms of importance. So just wanted to clarify that. The next benefit category is that the US presence enhances Japan and South Korea's defense capabilities, as well as promotes interoperability with US forces and weapon systems. So one way it does this, for example, is the, the forward presence of the US military in Japan and South Korea enables for joint military exercises with those host nations. And uh, I think one recent example of interoperability is with Japan. Uh, we learned through the course of our engagement that Japan is remodeling its fleet of helicopter carriers to be interoperable with US F-35 fighter jets. And so beyond this more, I, I guess, narrow physical interoperability between forces and systems, several experts also noted that the US military presence facilitates intelligence sharing with Japan and South Korea, which is another important form of, of interoperability. So the other, uh, the next benefit is that the presence allows for the U.S. military to respond quickly to various contingencies, be they of the military variety, like a conflict breaking out in the region, or a non-military um, contingency, such as humanitarian crises and natural disasters. And uh, one example we heard pretty often from experts and officials alike is that U.S. forces Japan provided disaster relief assistance following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. And then again in 2013, in response to a typhoon in the Philippines. Um, one thing though that was interesting is that several experts noted that whereas US forces in Japan are able to respond to these non-military contingencies throughout the region, our forces in South Korea are less flexible to respond to these kind of contingencies because their purpose is, is largely to remain fixed in South Korea for deterrence reasons. Um, the next benefit category is that the presence helps to support 
efforts to achieve North Korean denuclearization, as well as more generally promote non-proliferation through various surveillance and interdiction activities. Um, and in addition to, to promoting non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and technology to adversaries in the region, um, experts also noted that the presence and the security assurances that it provides to our allies also makes it less likely that there's going to be proliferation among our allies. For example, Japan and, and South Korea will be less likely to pursue their own nuclear weapons um, because we're there providing them those security assurances. Uh, the next benefit is um, another key one that I think a lot of experts strongly underlined and emphasized is that our presence is key to our relationships with Japan and South Korea. Um, the military presence demonstrates US commitment to their security as well as to the region's security. And in other words, that presence signals to our allies that the United States has proverbial skin in the game. We heard that phrase quite a bit from experts. And in addition to strengthening our bilateral relationships with Japan and South Korea, a couple of experts also said that the US military presence can help be a mediating force in the historically fraught relationship between Japan and South Korea. And then lastly, while not its primary function, experts agreed that the US military presence promotes a free and open Indo-Pacific. If you're not familiar with this term, um, a free and open Indo-Pacific refers to a broad strategic vi vision for the region that includes goals such as the promotion of good governance, as well as economic prosperity. And the way the military presence does this, um, albeit perhaps a little indirectly, is by protecting supply lines and trade routes that help facilitate regional economic prosperity. So that's, I think, a very quick rundown of the different benefits that we identified and learned about through our work. I do want to quickly note, though, that there were also a couple of challenges that some experts said were associated with that presence. Uh, foremost among them is that our presence can sometimes engender local opposition. And you know, I think Jody mentioned earlier that one of the particularly sensitive or contentious parts of our presence is on Okinawa. Um, it's been a particularly sensitive issue in uh, Japanese domestic politics and has also been a challenge in our um, alliance management, um, so much so that some experts even doubted the political sustainability of some of our bases. Uh, according to DOD and state officials, however, um, overall, uh, the, the Japanese and Korean public are generally pretty supportive of the US presence in their countries. And then the last challenge that we heard about was that just by virtue of having a forward presence in Japan and South Korea, um, our troops are at increased vulnerability to a potential first strike from an adversary such as North Korea. On, on the other hand, however, um, insofar as our presence provides a deterrent to such conflict breaking out, um, one would hope that such a first strike um, is not um, you know, terribly likely. Um, so I think that concludes my discussion of our first finding. Again, look forward to your questions after our presentation. Um, but until then, I will hand it off to my colleague, Matt, for a discussion of the US costs in Japan and South Korea. Right, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and Sarah, if you could go to the, the next slide for me. Um, there we go, thank you. Um, we're gonna turn now to US obligations in Japan and South Korea. And we've got three figures that we want to highlight, starting with Japan. Uh, so first, from 2016 through 2019, the United States obligated a total of $20.9 billion in Japan. And the figure on the screen that you see is that $20.9 billion broken down by year and by military service. Now, a quick note about obligations. When we talk about U.S. Uh, money from the U.S. perspective, we're talking about obligations. Uh, and it's not complicated, but it's important to clarify what an obligation is and what we mean by that term. Uh, an obligation is not the same thing as money spent or money expended, although that data would be very similar. Uh, an obligation uh, is when an agency places an order or signs a contract or purchases a service. Essentially, it's just a promise or a commitment that the agency will spend a certain amount of money. So for example, uh, if the US were to commit to spending a $10 million to build a new airplane hangar in Japan, um, that $10 million may not be spent or expended all at once, but it might happen over a couple of years. Um, so that's an important note to clarify as far as the, the type of money we're talking about here in Japan and South Korea from the U.S. perspective. Now, I'll let this, this figure mostly speak for itself, except for a couple quick notes. Uh, first, uh, in this figure and the next figure, you can get a sense of the size of each of the services 
presence in Japan and South Korea by what their obligations are. For example, and Jody touched on this a few minutes ago, the Marine Corps has a significant presence in Okinawa and Japan. And you can see that reflected in this figure um, and that they have a, a sizable uh, chunk of the obligations uh, in Japan. Uh, addition, additionally, there are about 20,000 Navy personnel in Japan, which is also a sizable number. The Army has the smallest obligations in Japan, but they have a much larger presence in South Korea, as we'll see now. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, now, I, I mentioned the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps specifically on the last slide to draw a contrast um, with this figure uh, in South Korea. Uh, and you can see that the sizes of the obligations for the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps are quite different uh, between Japan and South Korea. Now, uh, the US obligated a total of $13.4 billion in South Korea from 2016 through 2019. Uh, and that's the total of this figure here, which again is broken down just by year uh, and military service. Um, Conversely to Japan, the Navy and the Marine Corps have a very minimal presence in South Korea. And again, you can see that reflected here in the figure. In fact, about 98% of the obligations for the US military presence in South Korea were for the Army and the Air Force. Specifically, the majority of, there are about, there are about 28,500 US service members in South Korea, and the majority are Army personnel, and they are based at Camp Humphreys, uh, which is a, a new US military installation um, about 30 kilometers south of Seoul. Conversely, the Marine Corps have a much lighter footprint in South Korea than they do in Japan. There are only about 280 Marines in South Korea. Um, do you go to the next slide for me, Sarah? Thank you. Um, now quickly, uh, we wanted to also highlight a different breakdown of U.S. obligations. So this is the, U these are U.S. obligations in South Korea. Uh, so the total here again is $13.4 billion. But instead of being broken out by service, uh, we've broken this figure out by appropriation. And you can see them listed uh, in the key on the bottom of the figure. The five appropriation accounts in which the US obligates funds in Japan and South Korea are for military personnel, operation and maintenance, family housing, operation and maintenance, family housing construction, and military construction. Um, now, the reason that we wanted to show this breakdown is because it gives you a clear view of what expenses are associated with the US presence that the United States covers and what expenses that the host nation is more likely to cover. So you can see that the vast majority of US obligations are for military personnel, uh, which covers military personnel's pay, allowances, permanent change of station travel, uh, and operation and maintenance, which uh, obviously includes operation and maintenance for equipment and vehicles, civilian salaries, and repair of facilities, among other things. So does this breakdown that you see in front of you indicate that there was very little construction, uh, whether for family housing or military, um, in South Korea from 2016 through 2019? No. In fact, much of the host nation contributions, as Brian is about to detail, were for construction projects, uh, often that were associated with the relocation of US personnel. So I'll hand it over now to Brian uh, to cover a little bit more about that. Great, thanks very much, Matt. We can move on to the next slide. And, and Matt's exactly right. One last aspect of the key findings in our report that we wanted to discuss today is burden sharing. That is the contributions that Japan and South Korea make in support of the US military presence in their countries. So at a high level, we found that in the four years we reviewed, Japan provided $12.6 billion in direct financial support for the US military presence and South Korea provided $5.8 billion. And we broke that out into several ways in our report, and we'll start with a figure you can see here on slide 11. So starting with Japan. As Jody mentioned, there's a number of agreements that the United States has with both Japan and South Korea, including the special measures agreements that govern the costs that are borne by the Japanese and South Korean governments. So in Japan, the SMA covers things shown in blue here, like labor. Japan provides salaries and benefits for some Japanese nationals working in US bases, uh, and that's capped at about 23,000 employees in Japan and totaled roughly $4.3 billion in the timeframe that we looked at. 
it also covers a portion of US utilities in Japan. So that's going to include things like electricity, gas, and water. Uh, and Japan provides those funds as a direct cash payment, which totaled about $819 million in our time frame. And then lastly, the SMA also covers training relocation. So that's additional cash payments to offset the financial costs of moving some high noise training exercises. That's training like uh, things that would include live fire artillery. So now looking at the items shaded in gray, uh, those are other initiatives that fell outside of the SMAs. And the one big one here you can see for Japan is the Defense Policy Review Initiative and the DPRI. And, and the DPRI stems from a 2006 agreement between the United States and Japan that set in motion a number of realignment initiatives, including a reduction in the Marine Corps footprint on Okinawa. And GAO has actually reviewed this initiative and reported on it in 2017 for anyone who's interested in learning more. That's GAO. 17-415. And you'll also note that there are some other initiatives listed here uh, that includes things like labor costs. Um, these are just labor costs that are not included in the SMA, but that Japan also pays because they're required by Japanese law. That's things like certain health checks and immunizations, uniforms, and some social insurances. Uh, we can move next to South Korea. So next slide, please. Thank you. And here we've broken it up much the same way. Uh, in blue, you'll see the direct financial support provided under the SMAs. We actually had two different SMAs with South Korea during the time of our review. One covered 2016 through 2018 and another covered 2019. And like in Japan, South Korea pays for labor costs. They made direct cash payments totaling $1.4 billion in 2016 through 2019. And they also provided certain logistics support. Uh, that's through Korean firms for things like storage, transportation, and maintenance. They also funded some construction costs, which they made as in-kind contributions and totaled about $1.4 billion in the time period. Then outside the SMA, South Korea also funded the Yongsong Relocation Plan, the YRP. And this is actually a South Korean initiative that they requested in order to relocate troops out of a highly populated area of Seoul. You heard Jody and Matt talk a little bit about Camp Humphreys and being on the outskirts of Seoul. And so the United States agreed with this with South Korea back in 2004, with the main goal of returning some of those facilities in Seoul back to South Korea and for South Korea to help fund some of the construction at Camp Humphreys. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Great. And lastly, we looked at indirect costs borne by Japan and South Korea, usually in the form of some foregone rents, uh, revenues from rents on facilities and land or waived taxes and duties. And, and both countries do things like this and most of it is also governed by the respective SMAs. In Japan, the Japanese government provides subsidies to local communities that are near US bases. And DOD officials told us that these subsidies increase domestic political support, but that they're done by the Japanese government's own initiative and not requested by the United States. And then in South Korea, we note here the Korean augmentation to the US Army. And this is essentially a branch of the South Korean Army that augments the eighth US Army in Korea. And they serve alongside each other and supplement each other. And then one thing you won't see in our analysis on this slide related to indirect funds is really any dollar amounts. Uh, according to DOD, it's very difficult to track these indirect contributions. Japan and South Korea don't release them. And DOD says it's too hard to estimate how much tax they could be liable for, or for example, how many tolls they may have avoided as a result of these waivers. So that concludes the key findings of our report. We can move on to the next slide. And as Dr. LeMay said, the report is available at GAO's website. It's GAO report GAO-21-270. And there you can take a look at, get more information on our findings. You can also, as, as Jonathan mentioned, Appendix 1 lays out a lot of information about how we conducted our review. We also have in Appendix 2 and 3, a lot of tables that break down all the financial information that Matt and I were talking about so that you can see the details and see how we summed things up. Um, on the website, we, as Dr. LeMay said, also have a link in Japanese and Korean for people who are more familiar with those languages. Um, so with that, I, I thank you very much and thank you for having us for the East West Center today. And I'll turn it over to Dr. LeMay for any questions. Well, terrific. Thank you so much for a, a really excellent, well-structured, uh, clear presentation. Um, I think our colleagues will, will benefit from it and particularly from all the rich material in your report. 
Now, as we promised, we would uh, go to Q&A and there is one uh, question um, in the Q&A. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna just uh, frame it because our YouTube uh, viewers cannot see these questions. So I read them out in part so that they know what folks are responding to. So we have a question from the Voice of America Korean service. And he says that it's obviously the report has uh, garnered a lot of attention in the South Korean media. And although they generally agreed that the GAO report, the GAO report was well balanced, some criticized taking out, quote, indirect cost contribution from South Korea as highly inaccurate, reflecting the ratio of South Korea's real contribution to the alliance, which has potential difference in positions towards the Special Measures Agreement, SMA negotiations. What is GAO's take on this argument? Who would like to pick up that question and, and maybe uh, respond both in terms of the Korea as well as the Japan case? So I can just start off and my colleagues can jump in um, that we looked, as I mentioned, we do discuss indirect contributions in our in our report. And we do note in the report that sometimes these contributions can be substantial. And we and we very much, I think, understand that, you know, it's very hard to do a comparison of of Japanese and Korean contributions to the US military presence in those countries versus the DOD obligations that, that Matt was talking about. And so, you know, again, our mandate had very clear languages, as Jason was mentioning, that we were kind of uh, sent to look at the facts and to provide those. And so the comparison is something that we didn't make, I think, one, because of, of the direction of that mandate, and two, because of the difficulty in trying to figure out, I think, as, as you mentioned, that especially the indirect contributions, which again, in many cases, DOD does not track, and South Korea and Japan do not release. So it was, it was a little bit too hard for us in that. And again, like I said, my colleagues may have different perspectives on that or, or something else to add. Others, I would invite others from our GAO team to maybe comment if they have any further. Diana? Yeah, the only thing I, I would add to that is um, it's, you know, one of the things that folks may think as, as they're reading our report, which is, which is concise and rolls up a, a lot of information, um, it, it's difficult to underestimate how difficult it was for this team to collect, analyze, and report the information just on the level of US costs, right? Just, just that information, you would think that would be something very easy to, to, to kind of dig out. That was not easy at all. I could defer to the, the analysts on the team who were involved in, in the trenches on that. So that was, that was a really hard lift because that information is scattered around different, different parts of, of the Defense Department. Um, the information on the direct contributions made by governments of South Korea and Japan was also something we obtained through the US government. And there was reasonably accurate fidelity on that information. When we moved into the realm of indirect costs, um, certainly recognize that there are important contributions made uh, by, by Japan and South Korea that are indirect in nature. We didn't have good information sources within the US government to get dollars around those figures. So we were, we were really limited in our ability to try to put a, to put a price tag on those things. Um, we, we tried to be uh, transparent about that in the report. And I think that we were, but there are real limitations in our ability to, to report on those indirect costs and even reporting on just direct US costs for our own military presence was a heavy lift. But I'll hand out to my, the colleagues of mine who are actually the ones doing the real work. Hey, Diana, before you go on and hand off, let me just sure. follow up on the question. I can quite understand why different parts of the Pentagon have different, keep different numbers and, and are managing different sets of numbers. Uh, but given uh, the attention to this issue that comes up periodically in the special measures agreement renegotiations or host nation support or whichever one, um, has there ever been consideration given to finding a way to bring the different offices together uh, to, if you will, standardize the numbers? When I say standardize, I mean provide methodologies that allow you to compare over fiscal years and dollar values uh, these contributions. 
because it would seem to me as a messaging component of our alliance relationships, having this to hand rather than having to do the hard work that you guys had to do might be useful in communicating this element of the relationship. And of course, numbers are only one element, but, but they're an important element as, as we go through this process um, recurrently. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, th I think there's, there's definitely merit in that. You know, from a, from a US perspective, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar investment uh, in, terms, in terms of the dollars. It's, it's thousands of US personnel that we have, that we have stationed in, in both Japan and, and South Korea. And, and both those nations are absolutely vital to U.S. national security and are among our strongest allies around the globe. And so having a more systematic way to make it easier to report on the, the, the levels of from the, from the U.S. perspective of cost could be helpful in, in informing debate and discussion. I think that's something that falls in, in frankly, Congress's lap mm -hmm. to do. Um, technically, there are some sort of uh, limitations within the way that the DOD handles its budgets and reports its information. Those are not insurmountable. And certainly one of the things that our report illustrates is that it is possible to, to bring those figures together to inform debate. Thank you, Savant. Anyone else from the GAO team? Uh, Matthew Kinsley, I think, has some comments. Yeah, just a quick addendum or addition to what Diana mentioned. I, I would I would agree. I would second the fact that it would be probably uh, certainly would have made our lives a little bit easier if there was some um, you know uh, database uh, of all this all this U.S. Uh, obligation data in one spot. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that right now uh, the services are responsible for collecting and reporting the obligation wow. data. So, uh, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps all have their own separate systems and they all have their separate methods and offices for collecting, aggregating and reporting this obligation data. So, uh, you know, this is not a statement about whether that's uh, an incorrect or a correct way to do it, but that's simply the fact of the matter uh, of how that's done right now. Um, well, that, that's very interesting. So services keep the data and report directly, presumably through their service chains to the Pentagon rather than the uh, civilian uh, oversight keeping it at in one shop at the Pentagon. Is that is that a fair uh, uh, description? It, there there is an effort in the Pentagon to to aggregate this information and report it to Congress. But you know we we went to the services to get the information from them um, because they are the ones collecting it on the ground, so to speak. Great. Well, we have lots of questions in the Q and A and as well as the chat section. So I want to get to them. There is a Mister. Uh, 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 there's a Yoshikawa-san, Hideki Yoshikawa, from the Okinawa Environmental Justice Project, and he thanks you for your presentations, which have been informative. And this is relating to Henneko, of course. Um, so, you know, he quotes a particular page 23 on your Henneko report about local opposition and the delays, but to question, get to his questions, which are twofold. One, was the GAO able to collect detailed information on the issues from the Japanese government or the DOD relating to that? I think both Ms. Sendell and others re referred to, you know, the issues surrounding, as we're all aware about Okinawa. And two, if so, has the GAO made any assessment of the feasibility of the plan? Was the feasibility of that plan part of your uh, terms of reference for this report? Or is there a separate report on that? I'll take that one. So this review did not look into the issues of going on at the Futema replacement facility. But as uh, Brian mentioned in 2017, we did issue a report looking at the Asia Pacific realignment and in part what was going on with the consolidation and in Okinawa and the building up of the Futema replacement facility. Um, so at that point, we talked about challenges to the new facility, um, one of them being the shortened runway length. Um, the current MCAS Futenma has one long runway, it's about 9,000 feet. At the Futenma replacement facility, the runway will be like V-shaped, two runways, about 5,000 feet each. And so that leads us a capability for our U.S. military as well as a United Nations emergency landing strip. At the time of our review, DOD had not yet come to a conclusion on how to solve that problem. Um, and as we've been doing our follow-up, a part of GAO's job is to follow up on our recommendations each year, we found that DOD still has not come to an agreement with Japan on that alternate runway to provide that emergency use so that there could be an extra landing strip if needed. Um, another issue we saw in Japan at the time wasn't necessarily Okinawa um, related, but 
with Iwakuni. Um, as we moved units from Okinawa to Iwakuni, we didn't necessarily have the training opportunities available there that they needed. And so some of those units were needed to fly back to Okinawa to complete their training. And so we thought that DOD as working with Japan needed to come up with a, an agreement or a, some sort of solution to be able to resolve that. Otherwise the United States was spending extra money and time sending the forces back to Okinawa to complete the training and then going back to Iwakuni, which was their new home base. Um, and again, uh, when we've been following up on that recommendation, the Department of Defense has not yet um, come to any resolution on that issue. So um, again, this report did not look at those issues, but as part of our prior work, we continue to follow up on the recommendations that we have made and see if DOD has made any response. Anyone else on this issue? Because I note that in the chat, as opposed to the Q&A, uh, 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 Mr. Loomis has uh, raised it, uh, referenced the 2017 report you mentioned, Ms. Sendell. Um, and I'm familiar with that report as well, having looked at it in, a, in an earlier incarnation. So is there any plans to update that report? Um, and if you could provide a link to it, uh, that would be terrific as well for our, for our viewers and our participants. But you, you could see the comment. Do, do you have any comments to those two questions there, Ms. Sendell, about uh, you know, uh, you know, explaining these delays and, and, and plans to um, take on further investigation of that earlier, now five-year-old report? Yeah, so the delays definitely remain an issue. Um, when we submitted our report, we knew that the delays would be beyond 2030. Um, and it definitely seems like that's continuing. We do have future work and progress that will look at um, more issues with the Pacific region and the DOD military presence. Uh, per the 2020 NDAA, the Department of Defense has to submit a report to the Congress um, looking at certain issues about our realignment over there. Once that report is issued, um, GAO is then required to review it as well as um, provide updates on what's going on with the realignment. Given our current situation where we're not traveling, that job is on hold. Um, we're still waiting for the DOD report and we'd like to be able to do that job when we can actually travel to the region and see what's going on. Um, but there is definitely congressional interest in this subject. And so as a part of that, GAO will continue to look at this. Um, in the meantime, keep checking out our website and look at our recommendation follow-up. That is all public. So if you were to look up GAO 17415 and look at the recommendation status, you can see our most up-to-date information that we have from the department. Wonderful, thank you so much, because that's a really, you know, hovering issue over the US-Japan alliance is this ongoing, you know, for decades now, discussion of Okinawa, the cost presence. Um, the, well, I have lots of questions about services and the evolving service uh, doctrines, uh, including uh, plans for the Marine Corps, particularly the Marine Corps do nuclear doctrine, uh, not, I wouldn't call it doctrine, but plans for the region and how those would impact some of these cost scenarios. But let me go to uh, Evan Sankey asks, and this is really important and interesting question. Um, and I'm not sure, I'd love to know your answers to, does the methodology allow you to reach some net uh, conclusion, uh, conclusion about the net rather than gross financial costs in Japan and South Korea? I imagine this is a methodological nightmare um, in order to arrive at net costs when dollar, um, dollar terms have, are not fixed and are in themselves quite difficult to grasp. But you guys are the experts. What do you think? Can you, can you really come to a net dollar cost on the issues like this? I think from, uh, from our perspective, from this report, the answer was uh, no, oh, we, we could not. Um, although I, can, I definitely understand the, the interest in, in doing that. Um, one of the things I think that the careful reader will note is that, you know, we did not attempt to say, oh, well, the U.S. spent a total of X in Japan minus the amount that Japan contributed and that made that equals a delta. Um, in large part because that was an, an apples to oranges comparison, right? So the U.S. obligations were there to support the cost of having that military presence. The contributions made by Japan or South Korea under treaty are not designed to fully offset those costs. In addition, as, as we've already discussed, um, we didn't have good information to allow us to report on, on indirect contributions. So for those and a variety of other reasons, I think some of my colleagues can provide as well. Um, we 
definitely wanted to stay away from a, from a net analysis around that. Um, we do think our report is a valuable contribution to debate and discussion around those topics, but it wasn't something that we did it in, in our work. And I'll, I don't matter, Jonathan, if you want to amplify any of that. Uh, uh, others um, maybe come in and this, I, I'm going to just take a moderator's prerogative here to throw in as you others um, respond to this. There is this whole issue of qualitative versus quantitative. I mean, part of the debates in our country have been, as you well know, at the political level about who, who wins, who, 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 who's better off, us, our allies, South Korea or Japan, who's getting the better deal, if you will, uh, to frame it. But when you came to those six points uh, about the benefits, um, I, I'd like to ask you, how should we think of this? I mean, alliances are not just about dollars and cents. They're about, they're about values issues. They're about qualitative decisions about what you'd have to do or what you couldn't do with alliances. How should we think about that? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Quite apart from the net assessment of costs, what about measuring qualitative versus quantitative? These are, these are how, how do you do that? other than to state them as you did. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll do my best to answer at least part of it. So in our conversations with a lot of different experts, you know, initially we were interested in, hey, to what extent might we be able to quantify these different benefits? Can we assign a dollar value to these? And we heard time and again from experts that, um, A, that's probably not possible, and B, they weren't even sure that it was wise to do that because mm -hmm. it kind of played into a transactional view, to your point, mm -hmm. of our alliances and that, on some level, fundamentally, the benefits derived from our forward presence in these two nations it, it can't and perhaps shouldn't be quantified. They, um, um, yeah, I, I'll kind of end there and invite my team to kind of chime in. But we, we definitely heard from experts that um, they were interested in moving beyond a, a more narrow transactional view of our alliances. Others on the on this issue about transactionalism because. So, so let me offer one thing that sometimes is mentioned as a qualitative constraint on alliances and then offer something that's really positive, okay? But neither are really quite measurable in dollars and cents terms. Let me just offer a couple of um, things and you can tell me why I'm wrong. So our alliance with Korea is, is, has some constraints on the moving of our forces for non-Korean non -Korean peninsula contingencies, right? So in some sense, yeah, there's a qualitative benefit for addressing, you talked about you know, our eighth army and the uh, Iraq army's uh, assistance augmentation, I said the word you used. On the other hand, one could say qualitatively, it kind of ties down American forces, uh, right? Because it's um, restricted use uh, of um, on, the, on the benefit side, if you did a calculation, and when, I've, I've tried to do it on the back of an envelope, for how quickly things move with the tyranny of distance, the location miles, nautical miles or, or flight miles from locations in Japan to Korea to potential contingencies or uses uh, would save a lot of, you could count up the amount of fuel, you could count up the amount of, how, how, do you, how should we do that? How could we how could we do those kinds of analyses um, that are qualitative? Thoughts? I, I, I can take a stab at, at the purely defense side of this, and then Jason, I'll throw it over to you on more of the, uh, the, the foreign affairs and international relations aspect. So certainly from a perspective, it, it, it would be possible to come up with some dollar figures for the kinds of potential scenarios you, you pointed out, right? You know, how much would it cost to fly uh, uh, thousands of US Army personnel from South Korea to say Europe or, or the Middle East? So that's, that, that's, that's doable as a, at least as a back of the envelope kind of exercise. Um, and that, that might be of, of interest or importance around debate on those topics. Um, but I would imagine if, you know, not getting too far down the hypothetical road of any scenario where we needed to, where the U.S. needed to move thousands of U.S. Army troops out of South Korea to meet other some other contingency, um, 
my sense is that the cost of, you know, how, how much it's going to cost to fly them there may not be sort of, you know, top drawer of orders of importance, mm -hmm. that it would likely be a, a scenario where something has gone very, very wrong, or there's an extremely critical U.S. national security imperative to move uh, U.S. troops out of South Korea to, to, to meet other needs. Um, and it kind of address on the, on the transactional piece, and again, this is sort of just within the, the defense realm, you know, there are important intangible benefits coming from the, the military inoperability issues that, that Jonathan talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's, it's not an insignificant benefit, for example, that the, the, the Japanese government is purchasing F-35 aircraft, right? It's, a, it's the same aircraft that the US military is using. It makes it easier to exercise together. It makes it easier to train together. Um, so there's, there are benefits there as well. So there are intangible benefits as well as intangible costs on both sides of the ledger when it comes to the purely military aspects of, of our relationship. Jason, over to you on, on the broader alliance issues. Yeah, so this is a great discussion that's kind of at, at the heart of a lot of the matters and, and you all have already put out a lot of the good points. I'll just really add one which is, you know, if you, if you went and, and, and a lot of the work that we did obviously was with DOD, we were calculating the cost of the, you know, the forward deployed military presence. We did have the opportunity to, of course, spend time with the State Department as well. And I think, you know, what you would hear taking a step back from a strategic or international affairs perspective, you know, we just have to start with the admission that we don't enter into alliances because we think we're going to come out winners in, the, in, in counting the dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. Right. We do it for other larger strategic purposes, which are, frankly, on a year to year basis, um, just not the way that you want to go about approaching things. We don't have alliances so that this year our our, our books will balance. Mm -hmm. You know, we do it because we have a long term vested interest, as we do with these two important partners. And I think, you know, the more you try to compare dollars and cents on these things, the more you get away from those big picture questions, which are reasonable, you know, questions for debate. You know, we've clearly um, landed on a U.S. policy position as we have for a long time. Um, but I think looking at it from that strategic perspective is, is I think, where we would probably hear folks from the State Department and elsewhere come from. Great. I'm glad you brought up uh, the uh, big strategic and dip diplomatic elements of these alliances, too, because sometimes that gets washed over in these cost benefit uh, discussions. Let me turn to Jeff Hornung, our colleague at the RAND Corporation, himself a well-known analyst of, of issues related to particularly U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, he, asked, he says the report is superb, huge contribution to those of us who follow these issues. Uh, what, has been the, what have been the reactions from Tokyo and Seoul? Any thoughts? Um, did, did you do interviews in Tokyo and Seoul, not only with American you know, forces and American officials stationed there, but did you talk to uh, the MODs of ROK and the, you know, the self-defense forces in Japan. So in terms of uh, the information we collected during the course of the review, um, we did not meet with officials from, from the Japanese of the South Korean government. Um, we initially had plans to travel to both countries to gain important context, but then COVID hit. So uh, we, weren't, we weren't able to do that. Right. Um, um, and I, I wanna thank uh, Jeffrey for his kind words about our report. Um, we've, done some, we've done some media on this, including a recent interview with a Voice of America Korea. That's gotten a lot of attention, I know, in the Korean press. And I know from looking at some of our Google analytics that our translated one page summary in both Korean and Japanese is getting a lot of attention. And we're, we're very happy about that as well. Anyone else? Anyone else so for comments on Korean Japanese responses? No, we'll go to the next question then. This comes from a colonel. I'm not sure what service, but he asked a question about the Marine Corps anyway, about the move to Guam. Any updates on that? Because in some sense, as you well know, cost issues related to our presence in Okinawa and in Japan in generally are not unrelated to cost offsets vis-a-vis -vis our presence in Guam and Japanese payments for those. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, cal I, I understand a fairly complex calculation, but one nonetheless. Can you give us an update on where we are on the Guam relo so-called Guam relocation? The last time I was there, it was in process, but I don't know where we stand. Uh, I think in process is the correct word of where we are. Um, 
when we did our report in 2017, a big part of it was looking at the relocation to Guam. Um, and so we did have some recommendations that DOD update its cost estimate, update its schedule estimate, getting to the question, and improve some issues in Guam related to training and, and facilities and uh, risk assessments. And as of um, the last time we checked with DOD, there's that effort is still in progress. The one recommendation we made that DOD did implement was looking at um, risk to Guam um, facilities and construction. So looking at issues such as environmental issues or finding unexploded ordinance, what sort of actions would DOD take? And DOD did come up with a, a risk mitigation plan for those efforts. And so we gave DOD credit for taking that risk or taking that um, effort. What DOD still hasn't done is updated its schedule, hasn't updated its cost estimates. Um, and so we do hope that DOD continues to look at our recommendations and implement them to improve the um, relocation effort to Guam. Now, it, as I understand it, there's a sort of the, maybe Ms. Sendel, I got the number from you, but wasn't the goal to sort of get roughly nine to 10K Marines onto Guam? From the from the changes in Okinawa, and we're as I understand it now at about five k. Is that is that a reasonable understanding of where we are? I mean, we're about halfway there in terms of the actual relocation of the numbers of troops. The original agreement was to send about nine thousand to Guam solely, um, but then when the agreement was updated in twenty twelve, it was switched to just nine thousand off of Okinawa. They're not all going to Guam now. So going to Hawaii, the continental United States, and Australia on a rotational basis. Right. Oh, yes, as part of the northern uh, Darwin re, uh, rotation. But that's a fairly small rotation, as I understand it, around 3K. Uh, yeah. And the numbers for Hawaii and the continental United States still haven't been totally decided, at least at the time of our review, um, and we haven't had any updates since then. Okay, great. Anyone else on that one? No? Anyone? Okay. So let me turn to our colleague Ben Self from the Mike uh, Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundations. He asked, did you attempt to assess the value of technical skills, skill sets of host nation workers? As you mentioned, uh, both provide workers. Uh, for example, Japanese workers at Yokosuka provide maintenance or repair for US Navy vessels that would be difficult to replace in Hawaii or California. Um, any kind of a, a, a work on that in terms of uh, availability of the labor pool needed to service uh, US equipment and forces? That's, that, that's an excellent question. So that wasn't something that we addressed as part of this report. However, we did issue a report uh, early last year looking at the US Navy's approach to how it gets uh, maintenance performed on its ships when they're, when they're uh, ported overseas and that included a pretty detailed look at Yakuska. Uh, we also looked at some of the facilities in uh, uh, Spain and, and the Middle East as well. Uh, definitely recognize that in Yakuska, uh, US Navy is very much dependent on the technical skill of, of the Japanese workforce that is performing maintenance on US carriers and other combatant ships. Uh, their, their skill, you know, we didn't, as part of that review, we didn't sort of do a compare and contrast at the skill level of the Japanese workforce versus uh, the comparable US workforce, which is also performing the maintenance on US ships that are home ported back in the continental United States or in Hawaii. Um, but they are, from a Navy's perspective, they are all vital uh, assets from a, from a workforce management uh, angle to supporting and maintaining uh, the Navy's fleet. Anyone else on that? I mean, I know for a fact that in some US states that I have visited, uh, even on the, forget uh, uh, servicing military equipment and what have you, even availability of um, the required labor pool for high-end factories, um, you know, highly digitized and highly um, automated factory, completely civilian has been an issue. I mean, workforce development, uh, particularly in the technical side, whether through vocational programs, technical colleges, and, and education efforts, um, has been an ongoing concern. So again, hard to capture the numbers, I would imagine, but an important kind of intangible that you have a labor force that can do the work and, and provide the, uh, the required skills, yes? 
A absolutely. And, and you know, we could have a whole separate session just on that topic. But I, what I will say is that we issued a separate report apart from the one on uh, use of uh, foreign maintenance, uh, foreign uh, workforce to maintain Navy ships, looking focused on the US, the US workforce for doing maintenance on all different aspects what the military uses. It's called the, the, the depot enterprise here in the United States. That's 80,000 civilian workers. It's um, roughly on par in size with the coal industry in the United States. This is a highly skilled workforce. And you're absolutely right. There are some significant challenges in the Defense Department in recruiting and retaining um, that workforce. It is not just a function of you can grab someone off the street and give them a week of training and how to weld and you say, there you go, go fix a submarine. It, this, these are highly technical skills that require years of experience to, to do the maintenance work. And uh, so it is a significant challenge and it does dovetail with a, with a broader challenge here within the US of getting people into uh, technical and trade skills mm -hmm. and uh, having those folks available for um, performing those vital functions within the US economy. Well, thank you. That's, yeah, that's a terrific, and I think it's a really important national issue. Um, we now turn to um, Alice Kurima Newberry, uh, forgive my pronunciation, uh, Ms. Newberry, uh, is uh, from Win Without War, and she says, thank you for the presentation. Diana, I, I believe she's met you a few years ago to go over your findings on the Fatenma Replacement FRF uh, Facility Report. She's asking about uh, more about your methodologies um, and your conclusions and specifically about the issues of environmental harm, um, including for US troops, uh, poses to people on and off the base, um, a local resistance. Uh, you, you all referred to these issues. I mean, the opposition to Okinawa facilities is not new. Issues of environmental impacts are not new. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, this issue and how you came to your six points? I think it was Mr. Kingsley who uh, flagged the six sort of qualitative assessments of the benefits of the basis. So there's a lot there for some of all of you, I think, including Ms. Sandel and others, perhaps. I'll just start and just say it's wonderful to, to, to hear from you again, Alice. It was great to have a chance to, to talk with you earlier. Um, so our, our review did not look into the potential, uh, I guess, costs, I mean, it almost seems to trivialize it, but of the potential impacts from, from an, an environmental perspective uh, of having a, a military base and on uh, in any location, whether that's in Okinawa, Japan, South Korea, California, or Florida. I mean, there, there are some, are some residual impacts of having a military installation. And uh, you know we've done we have bodies of work looking at that both focused here in the U.S. as, as well as abroad. But I'll pass it off to the team to talk more specifically about some of the some of the great issues that you raised, and more specifically how we uh, frame the conversations with the experts about mm -hmm. the potential benefits and costs. Yeah, I'm happy to take the the piece about the methodology for our first finding on the benefits. So. Um, as I mentioned in, in my presentation of those six benefits, that list doesn't represent GAO's independent assessment of those benefits. I, I'm not a, a national security or an Indo-Pacific expert myself. So we leaned heavily on, on the experts that we had access to. So how we identified those six benefit categories, there were really, in my mind, three different buckets of information that we used. The first is that we analyzed various um, strategy and security documents, such as the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, the Indo-Pacific um, Report Strategy, so things of that nature. So that's one bucket. Then we also consulted um, a range of expert studies that we identified through a pretty extensive literature search. Um, so we had identified roughly 100 relevant studies. We analyzed and reviewed, the, reviewed those and from our review, kind of notice these recurring themes coming up. And we kind of summarize those into the six benefits. And then lastly, the way that we identified these six benefit categories was just through conversations with various DOD and state officials, as well as um, a diverse cross-section of, of non-governmental experts from various think tanks and universities. Um, so kind of to your second question about how did DOD inform our findings, it, it, DOD informed our findings as to the benefits, um, you know, 
given that we were reviewing DOD strategy documents and spoke to DOD officials. Mm -hmm. But we certainly didn't just rely on DOD's impression of those benefits. We, we did cast a wider net. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on those issues that uh, Ms. Newberry raised? Well, let me turn to a couple questions then for you, if I might, uh, while we await maybe some uh, additional questions. And of course, uh, we won't prolong this. Uh, if there are no questions, we want to make sure, I'm sure you have many other studies to get out, but I, I do want to ask you two questions. One is, here you are a legislative agency, you kind of frame this in the terms of the NDA 20. Um, how, what have been responses from the Hill? Um, I mean, uh, have you briefed uh, presumably Senate Armed Services and the House Armed Services Committees and others as, as have jurisdiction over various elements of the issues involved? So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. And are you aware of any assessments, uh, efforts that similar to those, maybe not the same, but similar to those that you've done by, uh, that have been done by the Japanese or ROK governments? to explain to their own citizens, these are two democratic countries with regular elections at all kinds of levels, um, the benefits and costs of, uh, of the presence of US forces uh, at a macro level, not specific issues, maybe one facility or, but, but this overall arching attempt to try to get at costs, benefits, for their own countries. I, I'm not aware of any, but I mean, maybe in, in your work, you found some reports like that. Well, I, I can take a stab at, at the first part of the question about, about um, the, the Hill's reaction, the uh, congressional reaction to our report, and then I'll hand it off to uh, one of my colleagues to kind of speak to some of the due diligence we did to see whether or not the, the South Korean or Japanese government had, had done some similar studies. So from a Hill perspective, um, we stayed in, in close contact with congressional staff who were, who were behind the mandates that included staff, not only from the armed services committees, but from the foreign relations and foreign affairs committees as well. Uh, we briefed them during the course of our work on what we were learning along the way. And we've, we've shared with them the results of our work and we've heard uh, positive feedback from them. Um, they were they're very appreciative of our efforts, and that's that's always gratifying to know that that we've been uh, one important contribution to congressional debate about this really vital issue. And I'll hand it off to I don't know Jody or Brian on what we did to find out what uh, some of our counterpart agencies may be doing in South Korea or Japan. Sure. So at the beginning of this review, we did reach out to the audit agencies in Japan and South Korea. So that's something like the Board of Audit in Japan. And uh, to make sure that we weren't duplicating any efforts to see if they were doing any ongoing reviews of their own. Um, and we found that they were not. Um, that's not to say that other, you know, the Ministry of Defense in one of the countries could be could be doing something like this. We're just not aware of any ongoing efforts to to do something about the costs of the U.S. presence or or even the benefits of the U.S. military presence in either of those countries. So we did reach out to them. We also shared our work with them last week when we when we um, issued the report and did hear back from them. You know, appreciating that we had done this work and that they would they would take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No, I, I, I would just say my own bias in this analytical work is that it would be terrific to have reports from ROK in Japan um, for this, because otherwise what's left in the discussion is sort of um, the United States offering, um, you know, an effort to assess and analyze these as you have done, many independent institutions have done, as you well know, there have been congressionally mandated studies from think tanks, there's FFRDC reports, there's service reports. So I've often felt it would be really terrific given that these alliance arrangements are uh, bilateral um, and that you know, the other side would have assessments too. And in fact, the gap analysis could be quite interesting uh, for managing the alliance and for a managing relationship. Maybe not always easy and comfortable, but would, would give it a less, um, if you will, for the lack of a better word, a one-sided perspective on the benefits and costs of the alliance, uh, since there are two parties to, to each of these alliances. Um, I do have, um, I did buy some time and, and, and with my question, so there are two more. So let me go back to the chat and make sure everyone feels like they're included because we definitely at the East West Center wanna, 
We have public programs primarily that everyone has an opportunity to engage on these important discussions. Uh, Colonel um, Lamb again, Army, thank you for identifying your service, sir. Um, I, was all, I was the deputy in, to Ambassador Holmes when we negotiated the first defense cost sharing or agreements with Japan and Korea. And he asks, uh, uh, he notes, we made a decision early on not to ask those two countries to pay US personnel costs or basic uh, operations and maintenance costs because we would incur them regardless where our forces were based. Um, and he says, the question specifically is, do you, not, do you not think that fact should be identified up front in the report? I, I'm afraid I don't know whether it is or not, but I, I wondered how you dealt with this issue about this wasn't part of the ask, if you will, or I understand it's not part of the ask. Any thoughts? I'll just take a quick stab at that one and, and appreciate the context on that one. And, and I think it is very helpful for to people to understand the historical context for all these decisions, because as we've talked about, you know, the decisions about the alliances and the nature and the scope have, have been on for uh, multiple decades. Uh, I would just say you're kind of right in, in your proposition, which is we were really just folk asked to focus on the 2016 to 2019 time period. Um, and you know, so on a lot of those decisions that predate and certainly inform where we were in 2016 to 2019, you know, weren't really the focus of what Congress wanted the new information on from us. Hmm. Okay. I can add a little a little bit to that. Please, please, Mr. Kingsley. Yeah. Um, so as far as, you, you know, we, we had some of the, we touched on this a little bit early on in our conversations with DOD about, um, you know, Japan and South Korea not specifically not contributing financially to military personnel or operations and maintenance costs, lest there be a perception that Japan and Korea are paying uh, the U.S., um, it, it, you know, the, it, the, it, to be mercenaries. And that's the term that, you know, DOD officials used um, in interviews to us, and there's, you know, for obvious reasons, that's a very sensitive topic, and that's not the case. Um, and, you know, so that's something that you know, they take great pains to avoid, and that's why a lot of the contributions from Japan and Korea are for construction and, re uh, and relocations of U.S. personnel uh, in those host nations. Uh, the second thing I'll add uh, is that we touched on this debate a little bit um, in, in our appendix one, with, which is our methodology. Uh, and, and simply put, if, if the U.S. did not have or if the U.S. chose to remove personnel, its military personnel from Japan and South Korea, um, it, is, it is not a guarantee that they would just be relocated elsewhere. Uh, it's possible that some of those, some of those service members um, will be phased out of the military in some capacity, um, and we don't know how many of them that would be. So to answer your question, yes, if they were just relocated elsewhere in the world, then those military personnel and O&M costs would likely be mostly the same, but that was an assumption that we were not prepared to make given the scope of our engagement. So we attempted to hit on that a little bit in the appendix, um, but the assumption of what would happen to these service members if they were no longer in South Korea or Japan was, was not something that we wanted to broach. Okay, anyone, anyone else? Before I uh, turn to Ben, so, uh, self, uh, he has an additional question about sort of um, GAO uh, and CRS functional differentiations, which um, is a great question. I've often wondered myself uh, and don't know enough about it. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. But let me ask you, have you done any studies? Um, I know they're not, they cannot be obviously the same, but US force presence as opposed to basing is not restricted to Korea and Japan. Uh, have you done any comparative work with Europe? Um, our basing elements there. Have you done sort of some non-basing assessments of cost benefits of US forces? For example, in the Philippines, as you well know, we have had traditionally a, a US Thai alliance, um, which again, is not the same kind of 55,000 forces and. 28,000, but, but there are, you know, there are elements of rotations and basing and access. Um, have you done any of those or do you intend in any near time frame to, to do that kind of comparative work? So I'll take a, I'll take a first stab at that. So pulling back the lens pretty much all the way, um, very broadly speaking, you know, depending on the year, DOD has some kind of military presence in a pretty large number of countries. 
outside the United States, and it varies dramatically in, in size, shape, and, and, and composition. So it's not surprising that GEO has done work over the years on uh, not necessarily the, the cost or benefits, but more operationally or more functionally what that presence is, is about. Um, I'm not immediately aware, and perhaps my colleagues may be, but I'm not immediately aware of an, another study similar to this one that we have done, that GAO has done in recent years of looking at costs and, and benefits of, of a large military, uh, US military uh, presence in, a, in another country. Okay. Yep. I'll, I'll just underscore, under, yeah, underscore what Diana said briefly and say, to my knowledge, some of the, the, the most recent reports um, that I can recall looking at, say, NATO burden sharing in Europe were from the 90s. Uh, I think we've done some other reports looking at maybe some stationing costs um, in Europe more recently, but like a more comprehensive view of, of costs and benefits. It's been, a, it's been a while since I think GAO's looked at that issue squarely in Europe. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I just uh, have been told by Sarah that there some question came by email. You don't have to answer these, but they, but they're but they're questions that have been posed uh, here uh, by a Mike uh, Choi or Che. Um, one question: It was any effort made to uh, assess. Uh, compensation for local damages and victims as a result of U.S. personnel issues. As you well know, there have been traditionally issues related to uh, crime, uh, maybe some property damage. Uh, I wondered if you had looked at those as some part of your calculations um, and how much you know budgets uh, they reflect. Um, there's something about cybersecurity and cyber warfare. I'm not really uh, sure what that is related to cost sharing with the host governments. If you want to say anything about that, I'm not just not sure that that was covered in your report. And does um, agreements like Jasomia between Japan and Korea save any money for the United States? I mean, there, I, I guess the question is motivated by the notion that there's a trilateral alliance and and, and, and interoperability, not only with the US, but a certain amount of sharing between the two alliance partners, Japan and Korea, would have some uh, implications for the US. Any thoughts on any of those questions? Um, let's see, I can, I'll, I'll weigh in initially on, on, on cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Uh, we, we, we did not get into that issue as, as part of the scope of, of this review. Much more broadly, GEO has a body of work looking at uh, DOD's efforts on, on cybersecurity and, and cyber warfare. Um, much of that work is publicly available. Um, I'm not the expert to speak to that, but, but that, that information is available on, on our website. Um, as far as uh, we, the potential costs of uh, criminal acts by US military personnel in, in either country, we did not look at that as, as, as part of this review. And then on, on the cost savings, I don't know, Jason, maybe you want to talk about that, sort of the, or, or maybe um, Jonathan about the, the mutually beneficial or mutually reinforcing nature of some of the benefits and how that, that could also affect or involve all three countries as opposed to the bilateral relationship. Yeah, let me just kind of quickly touch on this issue of compensation for, for residents. It's not something that we looked at specifically, um, but we, we do mention it in a table note in our discussion of indirect contributions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the indirect contributions that Japan um, sometimes counts are its uh, grants or subsidies to their local communities um, in mm -hmm. response to complaints about the US military presence. And uh, the Japanese government reports that they spend roughly about a billion dollars, um, I think every year on, on these grants. And we leave a note to that effect in the report, but obviously we're not in a position to, to evaluate um, you know, the reliability of, of that data. So it's something that we touched on, but we didn't really um, look at directly. Um, and then, so as to the mutual reinforcing nature of some of these benefits, I mentioned that a lot of experts noted that um, the most important benefit category was regional stability and security. And a lot of these other benefits kind of work to support that. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I might, be, I might be forgetting the exact nature of the question. I want to make sure I'm responsive to it. 
Do you see it there in your uh, chat section, uh, Mr. Adams? Otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it up here. I'm yeah, I'm looking at that now. I'll, okay. while, while I kind of gather my thoughts, I'll, I'll invite any of my other colleagues to to speak to that if they have any any insights. No, I, I think you hit hit it right on. I mean, it wasn't a specific focus of what we do, uh, of what we did on the report. You know, we had a little bit as as you just heard about, you know, on the bigger picture question, this is kind of the discussion we were sort of in before, right? You know, can you just count up the dollars and cents and right. say, you know, this is this is beneficial or not beneficial? I think there's a whole lot of things that you just can't quantify. And, you know, as, as we talk about in the report, there are some of these things which go beyond the United States and our particular interest. You know, J Japan and Korea certainly have their own interest in these things, and they make their own calculus and, and uh, their own alliances on these. So I think these are good issues to talk about. We didn't specifically opine on any of them uh, mm -hmm. in the direct way of, of the questioner, but I think they're good, good issues. Well, terrific. We are close, just three, four minutes away from our scheduled close. Uh, I realize this is over lunch, so maybe some of you had lunch over this uh, food for thought discussion as well, but uh, I haven't. So let's, um, let's finish up in the next three, four minutes and then we can, uh, for those of uh, us who haven't had lunch can get to it. But Ben uh, Self of the Bensfield Foundation does ask this question about GAO and CRS and it'd be great for our audience, especially since we've now had you on three or four times. I've been discussing with my CRS colleagues uh, the opportunity to have uh, programs as well. Um, so uh, welcome your thoughts on how you might frame uh, how you respectively service uh, the legislative branch. So um, I'll, I'll give I'll give a quick sixty second response because I see another question that, that that just popped in. So uh, GAO's role is to perform uh, basic research where we really dig into how effective and efficient the U.S. government is in executing programs and. Um, most of our reports actually have recommendations to federal agencies and federal departments on what they should be doing a better job of. Uh, CRS, our sister agency who we coordinate with very closely, collects and does research on an astounding array of, of uh, topics and provides factual information to Congress, but they do not typically make uh, recommendations about specific programs. But they are there as a resource to, to ask very oftentimes very specific questions from Congress about um, potential pros and cons of legislation, for example. Um, that would be a CRS question. Uh, a GAO question would be, all right, Congress passed a law. How well is DOD doing at implementing what they were told to do in the law? That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a thumbnail perspective on the difference. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on that? Yeah, I'll just add one other quick thought, and we have tremendous respect for our colleagues at CRS, and they perform a wonderful service to members of Congress and their staff. One other difference that I would point is, you know, we've been publishing reports for 100 years or so. Um, only recently um, did, did CRS be allowed to start putting out their reports publicly. You know, they historically have been providing confidential advice to members of Congress and their staff. Um, and so that's, that's another difference, uh, I think, between the two organizations historically. Well, as a user of reports from both GAO and CRS, uh, I would really encourage folks who are interested in a range of, of uh, Indo-Pacific and other issues to avail themselves of the ones that are available publicly. There really are extraordinarily useful resources um, and, and, and provide great uh, information, analysis, ways of thinking, methodologies, et cetera. So I really would encourage folks and I, I would close today's program since we're one minute away from closing time is to say that the East West Center, as some of you will know on this on this program today, is a congressionally mandated authorized institution. And it's uh, mandate is very clear in the language is to promote better understanding and relations between the United States and Asia through collaborative education, research and exchange. And a program like this is, is really right in our wheelhouse, what we're supposed to do to bring uh, experts together. Uh, I hope we can continue to work with GAO on future programs as you uh, work in the space. I mean, we're kind of in the Indo-Pacific space, which covers a lot of terrain these days, uh, but I hope you'll continue to think of us as a place to engage not only responses, but input 
um, on your thoughts from both the American and colleagues across across that big pond. And we uh, we really thank you for sparing your time today, your expertise with us, and we look forward to having you again. And for all our participants, whether you're on YouTube or joining us on this Zoom call, really do appreciate whatever time and wherever you're joining from uh, your interest in our programs. We have other programs coming up. Later this week, we have a program from uh, a series of next generation US-Japan's relationship experts. We've put out a series of eight pieces on various facets of the US-Japan relationship, including Okinawa, dual, use citizen, uh, dual citizenship, to um, issues of technology and economic cooperation in the US-Japan alliance. So I hope you'll join us uh, uh, for that as well. And other programs are in the works. So if you're not on our newsletter or, or our mailing list, please consider uh, doing so. Again, to our GAO colleagues, um, uh, Director Maurer, um, uh, Jason, and other team members, thank you so much. Be well, be safe, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.